I am really pleased uh, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Andrew Batran. He is a Pulitzer winning investigative data journalist at the Washington Post. Before joining the Post, um, he worked at the Boston Globe, the Virginian Pilot. He was a Chip Quinn scholar, for those of you who are familiar with that program, um, among many other stepping stones. Um, he's also taught data journalism um, at Wesleyan and at my alma mater, uh, American University. Um, but you will get to learn from him tonight without paying <laughs> that kind of tuition. Um, so uh, without further ado, Andrew, uh, take it away. We're very excited. Good evening, everyone. Um, sorry, I can't meet you in person, but uh, understandable. Um, I'm usually used to kind of uh, putting on workshops and uh, just kind of teaching hands-on with the reporters. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a, a new thing uh, where I'm kind of going to be talking about a lot of the, some of the stories that I've worked on in the past or other stories that I really admired and talk about some of the lessons that I think I, I pulled from it. So let me just get this started. My name is Andrew Tran. I am a ra rapid response investigative team reporter for the Washington Post. Um, and I have a website. I teach spreadsheets and data journalism to students at American University, like Anne said. And I also have a free website where I put, to, where I put up tutorials to help journalists learn the statistical language R. And it's been a big year, a couple of years um, that I've covered. Let's say we've recently I put out a story about uh, the more how more than 40% of Americans live in counties hit by climate disasters in 2021. Uh, looked at domestic terrorism incidents and how they've been increasing over the years. Um, I've looked at PPP loans and figured out, geolocated them and figured out the trends of where they were going and also looked at the, um, the effects of COVID. So I'm kind of everywhere. I've worked a lot with a lot of data and sometimes it's longer term stuff, sometimes it's quick turnaround stuff. So I feel like um, that probably reflects a lot of you as well. And we also worked with epidemiologists to get an underlying understanding of un undercounting deaths. Um, so this, is, this chart reminded me of something. Um, and then was, let me kind of describe this chart for, I'm sure most of you know this, but we have the kind of the dotted line of the expected deaths over based on the historical average or historical trends. And then we have the, this kind of lighter line and the light pink kind of showing the number of excess of, of number of number of deaths attributed to COVID. So you can see there's a trend of much more deaths in a given week. And then there's this dark line that indicates actual deaths. So there's this gap here between this dark pink reflecting an unknown, uncategorized am amount of deaths. And so it could be anything, it could be heart related or it could be undiagnosed COVID. But this chart, as I was looking at this, reminded me of something. And it reminded me of a moment in the classic children's book, The Little Prince, um, where the narrator tells a story about how he drew a picture when he was a child. Um, and he showed it to grownups in his life and asked if it scared them. They all laughed at him and asked why they should be scared of a hat. Uh, they said the drawing looks like kind of like a floppy brown hat that is colored brown. But the narrator was very disgusted and disappointed because it was obviously not a hat. In the book, he then shows a drawing of what the picture would look like if it wasn't colored in. And indeed, it is a boa constrictor eating an elephant. But the grown-ups can't see that because they lost that ability when they grew up. They no longer have any imagination. So we are always going to be presented various versions of this hat. But we as journalists already have the instincts to try to look deeper, to solve problems using creative and in not obvious ways, all for the benefit of the reader. So kind of the basics, as all of you know, how to do good data journalism, even without statistics or much math. And the secret is you don't really need to know much statistics at all. Um, Sarah Cohen, she's um, the night chair over at Arizona State University. She's been like a data editor at the New York Times, the Washington Post. She's, she wrote the book 
about numbers in newsrooms. She explained that she preferred to investigate and figure out her own numbers and figures instead of public relations person or a government official giving her inaccurate information for the specific story she was researching. But obviously, don't be horrible at math, or at least don't be afraid of it. So to be really kind of data minded as a journalist, you just really basically have to know right from wrong, or at least true from false, because computers may not be able to tell us right and wrong, but they know true and false, the binary, right? So this is a quote from Marty Baron given during his commencement speech at Lehigh University. And he's, he was talking about the spotlight investigation um, into the archdiocese of Boston, Catholic archdiocese, and where Boston priests had been accused of molesting 80 children. They were in court fighting with victims at the time, and the plaintiff's lawyers alleged that the cardinal himself knew of the priest's shocking history of abuse and yet reassigned him from one parish to the next. And so Globe reporters decided to get to the truth. And beyond this one case, they needed to know whether the church had repeatedly failed to disclose abuse, reassigning priests who had been credibly accused. And so the church was the most powerful institution in Boston, most Catholics per capita out of any city in the country. And yet they went ahead with the investigation and they went to court and they argued with the, that the law and the public interest demanded that the documents kept secret by the church be made public. So that was the court fight, but there was also a data component. So how do they find out while they're fighting, while the lawyers are in court, how can the reporters find out if the scandal went beyond Father Geegan? This is the father that was accused at the time. So the clues were in earlier cases against a father, James Porter, in Fall River, Rhode Island. Uh, he was convicted in 1993 for sexually abusing 28 boys and girls. And he said in one of the quotes uh, in an interview with a reporter actually said, it was the church that sent me from one parish to another. So I bet you remember this scene. Hopefully you can see this, hear this. What have you got? Church directories. It's every priest in Massachusetts, what parish they're assigned to. This is official? Yeah, I figured it can help us track down some of the priests that uh, Saudi Island mentioned. Maybe find some more victims. Can you tell us some more like that? Find that switch. You want to borrow my glasses? Oh, good. Look at that. Look, 1983. John Dagan, St. Brendan's Parish, Dorchester. So, so we can find out where any priest is at any given year? Yeah, I got him here. Huh. What? 1980, the year Gagan was pulled from JP. It says he's on sick leave. Come on, really says that? Where is uh, 1991? Yeah. Here. Barrett, Barrett, Liam. I can't read it. Barrett, Barrett. 1991 is the year they pulled him out of Charleston. Barrett, Liam. Yeah. Sick leave. It's an official designation. Kind of the lesson from all that is like leading to the lesson is the only technical skill you need for effective data journalism is just knowing your way around a spreadsheet. Your lack of math and data science skills is not what keeps you from being a data journalist. I mean, all you really need to know is organizing. Um, so this is a scene from the movie Spotlight. This is a, an actor portraying Matt Carroll. And he says later on, reflecting on this, that there was nothing fancy about the spreadsheet that they created. And I'll detail how they put it together in a little bit, but it had about a thousand or so rows. And what they did was they tracked priests, right? Based on all these directories, um, both before and after the story, he did data work that was much more complicated than this, but much more complicated, much more interesting from a professional point of view. Yet nothing else he's done has really come close to having the impact of that simple spreadsheet. So just because the data is simple doesn't mean it can't have major implications. And so this is a, an application that they put in for the IRE award, award where they describe exactly what they did kind of data-wise. And so they built a database of all the priests of the archdiocese in, in Boston who had been on, on, the, on any type of leave between 1983 and 2001. And so they assigned, they included assignments for all priests and they looked between 1980, yeah, 1983 and 2001. And they, he says here, it involves several weeks of work by four reporters 
and it showed that the number of priests on different types of leave mushroomed between the mid 1980s and the 1990s, as well as more victims came forward with allegations and so on. It was database was a major indicator of the extent of the problem. So a major kind of recurring theme for all these investigations, especially award-winning ones are the data didn't exist, so we had to build it ourselves. And so the impact of this particular story of their series was, you know, $10 million settlements to 86 um, of gigan victims, the refocused church seeking donations. Um, the sex cases cost the church $100 million. And as a result, the church properties had to be sold in the city to settle 500 cases. However, um, things have kind of progressed, of course, since then. More archdiocese across the country still every single year, it seems like another archdiocese is like, the, I think the recent one was possibly Pennsylvania, where there's like more of these things keep popping up. And kind of, this was a story that came out last year involving one of the uh, reporters from the, that original Spotlight story, looking at how the Catholic Church, um, you know, tens of millions of dollars in PPP loans went to Catholic Church dioceses whose financial stress was due not simply to the pandemic, but also to recent payouts to victims of clergy sex abuse. And Mike Rosendi's actually found a fiscal year audit from 2020 in Louisville showing that, um, admitting that they had felt no impact from COVID-19, but they were getting money anyway. So th this story is always continuing. And speaking of that, the only technical skill you need for data journalism is yes, spreadsheets, but you can also use a couple of other new skills. For example, what they did took several weeks, right? Because they had to pour through all those notebooks, all those directories and kind of line it up by hand and input it one by one into a spreadsheet that Matt Carroll was in charge of. However, today, all they needed to do was scan the documents from the directory and you can do that from a printer right now. You can scan it and email yourself PDFs of pages, whatever. And then if you were to do it today, you could OCR it using Adobe Acrobat and then make all the text recognizable as text. And then you can search it. Tabula actually was started with some journalists teaming up with technologists because we all know the pain of getting documents and tables sent to us in PDFs, right? Uh, because they want to make it as difficult as possible, or they just maybe don't know any better. But it's there, there are ways now to take stuff from unstructured data like that and structure it and pull it out. And so once you make the text searchable, then they could do command F, look up Gigan, and there he is in Dorchester at St. Brendan's Parish. So you can find him in other ones. So this is the sick leave that they were talking about, the absence. So you could build up a list this way and then build out the structure this way. This is similar to their data structure for their spreadsheet. And then you can quickly just kind of create a pivot table in Excel and figure out a pattern. How often did a priest move? And then you can count it up. You gotta, and then you can do this for every single priest. All right. And so this would, I, I did this with my, as an exercise with my students and it took, we, we, we got through a lot in just like one and a half hours. So imagine three weeks of work, you know, condensed and divided up among people. And you could do all that analysis that they did for spotlight within a few hours, probably a day, if you have like enough people just using this technology. So that technology has advanced. And so this leads me to another story. And this is kind of about getting data from people who don't want to give it to you. And you might want to learn how to minimally scrape websites because a lot of data these days is just not going to be emailed out. It's, they're just going to be like, it's on, we're going to publish it online daily. And so when you ask for like, is there a historical version of it? They're like, no, it's just whatever's online. So you might need to be set up these, these tools and there are easy tools you can use straight through your Google Chrome browser. So you don't need to be technically advanced. You just need to know how to install a plugin on Chrome. So this is one way in which I use something like that where I'm escaping data. And that brings me to the story about um, Roy Moore 
and Lee Kaufman in Alabama and how this group of women um, came forward right before the election and said that uh, the candidate for Senator Roy Moore had initiated a sexual encounter when they were teenagers. So Stephen McCrumman, Beth Reinhardt, Alice Kreitz followed the story. And as you can imagine, um, I'm sure as you recall, there was immediate pushback. They, everyone, every, there were reporters out there that were trying to background these women. There were, uh, the campaign accused them of trying to profit from it. They accused the Post of trying to pay for um, invest, you know, for, uh, for interviews and, and to make up claims. So that was pretty ridiculous. But one thing that came out was that there was, uh, so tips came in following this, right? And so all the reporters had to go and reach out and pretty much had to fact check everything, no matter the, how ridiculous the claim was. So one reporter, Beth, was reached out to by this woman named Jamie. And she claimed that she had been, she had a secret affair with uh, Roy Moore when he was older and when she was really young and that he had driven her across state lines to give her an abortion or, you know, to get an abortion. All right. And so as it turned out, of course, we found out later that um, all these circumstances happened. Um, Alice Kreitz, who is the um, researcher on the post at the post, we were all backgrounding her. I was also looking up her social media history as well. And so eventually when they met in person, Beth met her in person, this, this person, <laughs> Jamie, and she said, you know, um, she was trying to get Beth to say a lot of stuff that made Beth feel uncomfortable. And so one of the things that Beth mentioned to Jamie was like, we can't find your his work history anywhere. What is your name? And so Jamie had been giving all sorts of different names, but finally Jamie showed her her driver's license. And so from there, Beth was able to give that out to Alice and Alice was able to look up and find out that this woman was actually had a GoFundMe page where she said um, she was not in mortgage, but she had accepted a job to work in the conservative media movement to combat the lies and deceit of the liberal mainstream media. And she'll be using her skills as researcher and fact checker to help our movement. So Beth was, of course, reasonably freaked out. Um, she assumed that her conversation with Jamie in person had been recorded. And so everyone was gonna back out right away. But then uh, some editors were like, you know what, why don't we set up another meeting with Jamie and figure out who she works for? Because she had met with Beth, but she hadn't met with Jamie yet. And so you, uh, I don't know if you remember this uh, situation, but then this happened. Um, Stephanie went to go meet Jamie in person and along with some videographers and they had this, we'll watch this conversation. So there's not to be any video because it took a while for the videographers to get a table next to them uh, because there were other people sitting there. So right at the first part, it's only the audio from Stephanie that she had been wired up. So the videographers eventually were able to get a spot next to them. Uh, they had been sitting across the restaurant. That's the only place available. And so I remember Tom kind of saying like, he stood up, yawned and said, I'm going to move over there because the air is better. And so he and Dalton got up and went to sit over here. This is a GoFundMe um, page, yeah. um, which which has your name on it, Jamie Phillips. Yeah. And uh, and it has also, let's see, where was that? It lists um, somewhere a, a donation from the person that you said was your child, Taylor. Um, and it says that uh, that you're moving to New York. Um, and that you've accepted a job to work in the conservative media movement to combat the lies and deceit of the liberal MSM. I'll be using my skills as a researcher and fact checker to help our movement. So I just wanted to ask you if you could um, explain this. And I also wanted to let you know, Jamie, um, that this is being uh, recorded and video recorded. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I was looking to take a job last summer mm -hmm. in New York, but it fell through. So I ended up not taking the job. Okay. So, but you were interested in doing this job? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it was going to be with um, the Daily Caller. The Daily Caller. Yeah. Okay. But it didn't, it ended up falling through, so I wasn't able to do it. Uh -huh. My, because my fiance was relocating to New York, so I was looking for a job to go with him. Uh -huh. And I, it didn't work out. So I ended up just staying here for a week. Uh huh. Uh huh. And what was your interest in working for the Daily Caller? Um, I just, I like the, I like their stories. And I thought that I would be good at doing research and stuff like that. Because mm -hmm. just based on my background with the mortgage business, like that's pretty much all I do all day is like research things. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. But it didn't play out for me. So. Yeah. So, okay. So you, so you, you tried to get the job and you just, but you didn't get the job, you're saying? No, I went through the interview process and. So do you want to go over it more? Uh, you said you you said you work. Um, where do you live now, by the way? I'm not going to answer Okay. Okay. Sorry to brought you all the way out here. Okay. Again, Jamie, in all seriousness, if you if you want to say anything else about how it is that you came to be sitting here. Really, I mean, you're 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 welcome to do so. You have my number. I'm interested in hearing about it. She definitely was recording that bag right there. <laughs> that was definitely a video camera in that bag. And of course, Stephanie also knowing that was the case, moved her bag. So it was a little bit of a jostling of bags when this interview was starting out. As I was watching this video, and I had been backgrounding her a little bit as well. Um, I saw clearer when the story published exactly how she talked, what she looked like. And it occurred to me that I had met her months before at an IRE meetup in Washington, D.C. Um, and other reporters, as they saw the video, recalled her as well. And what happened was she was going to a D.C. meetup of investigative reporters and speaking to them. And so I remember... I had spoken to her and that of course freaked me out. And so I wanted to figure out exactly how far had she been planning this? How far had she been trying to infiltrate the post or try to speak to other reporters? Um, and when we chatted, I recall she said she was starting a news website with her brother focusing on stories that people actually cared about. Uh, she said, she asked me what I did at the post and what it was like to work there. And I finished and paid for my beer and, like, and she was like, oh, are you leaving already? So I looked up the meetup and I found her profile. This is not her, this is one of her fake names. Her real name is Jamie Phillips. This is one of her aliases. Um, and so I looked up, she was a member of 24 other meetups or other meetup groups. And they look, they range from New York City to DC. And she was a member of ONADC, uh, Online News Association. And I knew the organizer of ONADC was a friend and coworker. Uh, and I asked him, do you remember speaking to her? And he said, yes. Um, and so I wanted to figure out exactly how many meetups she had attended pretending to be a journalist. And I found all these pages, many different names. So each mem user on meetup.com has a unique ID number. And those are tied up to the meetups that users are a part of. And so her meetup pro, I, put that all into a spreadsheet. Um, and her meetup.com profile pages were still public. Um, she had joined 24 journalism and politics related groups since July. I met her in September. The big showdown with Stephanie McCrumman was in November around Thanksgiving. So she had signed up to attend 15 meetups, at least I, that I could track. And yeah. And so there, this is a directory of, and so at every meetup, there's a directory of attendees who sign up for it. And so does this remind you of something? The uh, Catholic directories, right? So 
what I did was I used, I didn't use this particular tool, but for those who don't know R programming or Python like myself, then there's this plugin called data miner you can do, and you can train it to scrape everything. So what I wanted to get was I wanted to get the list of the members so I could figure out who attended most often with her in case she had accomplices, or I could also reach out to them and ask them, like, do you recall who she was, where she came from, et cetera. And so I pulled that all, I downloaded it, I scraped it, and I structured it into a, a, a spreadsheet. So then I could do a pivot table and figure out who showed up most often. And then I could then reach out to them and say, do you remember this woman? And then people would respond and they would say, I, she looks familiar, I don't really recall. Um, and then as I was reaching out to them, people would, uh, sometimes people would reply back be like, and, and say, the link you sent me for this profile doesn't exist anymore. And so what was happening was as I was reaching out to people between sometime between like 5 p.m. as I was starting to reach out to people and 10 p.m., someone had reached out to her. And so she was starting to delete all her history. And so that's another thing, as you notice, this, this is me looking back later on. Uh, so she's no longer on this list. It's under former member. And it looks like there were two other former members as well. So maybe someone who I reached out to um, said, hey, the jig's up, they're onto you. But that's fine because I had already screenshot and archived everything. So that, I mean, that's what you have to do because uh, that was a risk. So I was able to, once I figured out that pattern, uh, figure out all her profiles, I was able to you know, recreate her steps of her social media transformation from a MAGA loving woman uh, who proudly put in Fifi in her profile name to creating an alias, you know, kind of, um, you, know, you know, spouting JFK quotes. And, you know, she went to uh, the Women's March and called it the Midal March. And then after her alias, she went to, uh, I think like uh, another like uh, a social justice protest pretending to support it. So we were able to kind of recreate the steps that she took to infiltrate the post, which dated months. And, but when you think about this story, you don't think about the data. And that's a good thing because the story really is about Lake Horfman and everyone else brave enough to reveal their past pain as inflicted by Roy Moore. And they put themselves in the public eye to be re-traumatized by being called liars, by being called you know, opportunists. And so the impact was we had to work hard to meticulously protect the story that was being told by these three amazing reporters below, Beth Reinhard, Stephanie McCrumman, and Alice Kreitz, because there's an ecosystem out there today churning out lies to distract from the truth that others can point to and say, see, this confirms my biases, so I will listen to that instead. My point is the antidote to misinformation is, is going to be transparency, and that's much easier to do as a data journalist because as we hold government officials accountable, readers are gonna hold us accountable as well. And so that's why I try to include methodology at the bottom of my stories showing my, prog my process. Uh, I reason I, one of the stories I talked about very early on was how we looked at data on, dom on domestic terror incidents and how the biggest increase was from right-wing violence. And at the bottom of our story, we have something called a methodology box where we just link out to the data that we used. We link out to the analysis and the process and it's on GitHub. And I, I, I put a lot more of my charts and analysis that doesn't get included in the story because you have to be kind of really thoughtful, right? When you're writing a story, you're not gonna notebook dump everything. But I wanted to show everyone that you know no stone was kind of unturned, which is good because this was such a delicate story, right? Everyone's gonna try to find a way to find some sort of bias in what I did. And so um, I think a fact, a fact checker for the Gateway Pundit reached out to me and was trying to you know, pick it apart and linked to my data and my process and said that you are claiming that uh, right-wing domestic terrorism on January 6th, um, what the victim was got the government and the potential suspects was labeled as violent far right. And he said, and uh, in, in the document, the data, we defined the participants as white nationalists. 
And so he was saying, do you think there were participants who were not fitting that description? Or do you feel confident that it is completely accurate? So I, he was trying to nail us for saying that this was in the, the public, the, the methodology from the data set where we had different types of extremism with labels, tags, white supremacists, stop the steal. Victim was, you know, the government building and the government itself, other victims as well. So we had different levels, right? And so they thought, oh, is the post trying to say that white supremacists were responsible for January 6th? Unfortunately, because we had the data up there, we could point to our sources, which was a testimony from FBI Director Chris Way, where he was asked by Senator Dick Durbin uh, if the Capitol attack involved white supremacists, and he replied that there were some involved. And that wasn't all of them, of course, but that was just for the level of tags, because you know we only have a couple tags. And also, this was never mentioned in the story. This is just lightly grazed by. We never said anything about white supremacists and January 6th. So this is a way, that's a, one way of like, we were able to avoid any kind of like pushback from, um, from trolls or from uh, bad faith actors, uh, bad faith arguments, because, um, because we made our data public and we could back it up and we cited things. So that's why I try to include methodology at the bottom of my stories to show my process. And also another benefit of doing that is that you can then be the bridge between the newsroom and other researchers, right? Because if you are diligent in showing your process, then this will reflect well with those who are diligent with their data analysis as well. And that often is, will lead to like really great breaking news type of research out there because Oftentimes you'll only see like maybe these researchers are working on some kind of project and you're only going to get it from a press release from their comms people. But if you know people who are specifically involved in whatever field you are interested in, you should be able to contact them and be in constant communication with them. Be like, what are you working on? I have this idea or I have this question. Do you have any data that might be able to help me explain it? So during the, right when COVID was occurring, there was the question of the excess deaths that I mentioned before. And there were only a handful of, of researchers out there. There was not really many stories out there as much as there are that came out afterwards. But there was a question of like, there's obviously an undercount, right? How can we measure that? And so there was not much data out there. CDC eventually released that data, but before then we had to come up with it ourselves. And so I had to go and research and find epidemiologists and figure out what can we do this? And they were, of course, were trying to tackle it. They hadn't done it yet, but I'm, you know, I spoke with uh, these Yale epidemiologists and we had a really great communication system set up because I worked with R and they worked in R so that their output, I could, you know, kind of deconstruct and generalize and explain to my editors and to readers much better than if I had just been given a summarized spreadsheet. And also I could then give him feedback be like, can we get this level of detail instead? Can we try this? Can we try that? You know, can we look for other comorbidities? So this is really important to be able to kind of speak both languages. And, you know, this will lead to more partnerships between yourself and whatever organization it is. Um, for some reason, they put together a big press release about, you know, the Washington Post working with these researchers. And we had weekly meetings. It was great to like have my, my little um, explainers or get their, you know, professional research point of view to be like, this is what's important. This is what's new. And you know, get that bridge, the line of communication between the editors, reporters, and epidemiologists. I mean, usually you don't need to put out a big press release. You can just have the meetings, but for some reason they wanted it, so. But as I said, um, yeah, so this is the story that we, you know, that I was able to, we were all able to work together with these epidemiologists and come up with something really interesting. In doing this as well, um, in documenting your work and trying to be really thorough and trying to be the gateway. Uh, it, this will endear, endear you to government officials responsible for data. Um, I can't list my examples, but there are countless, countless examples where uh, incidents or stories where I, uh, I reach out, not to the press people, but I say, can you send up a meeting with me? Or I just reach out to them individually, look them, look them up on LinkedIn, or there's a government like hierarchy somewhere. 
PDF of it somewhere where I reached out to the person who was responsible for that data set. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm looking at this data set. I'm trying to find X, figure out X, Y, and Z. I found this government data. Uh, I would really love it if I could walk my process by you so that you can kind of let me know if I've done anything wrong because I want to just make sure I get this story absolutely correct. So what's great is it builds up this level of trust, right? Because usually they're thinking that reporters are going to come at them and try to just look for every single little, like little error or like miss comma. But if you just want to care about the process, if you want to tell them, I just care about X, Y, and Z, and I'm trying to do it this way, does this look correct? Can you tell me if I'm doing anything wrong? They're, they're all about the data. And oftentimes they will help you out kind of on background. Be like, if you want to try to answer this question, you should do this, this, and that. You should look at these columns. You should look for this data set that I know exists, but you should probably need to request it. Or sometimes they will just kind of give it to you on the down low. And then you can later on write obtained by yourself, right? So this is another way of just why it's important to try to bring up that your level of data literacy so that you can kind of be able to talk with them. And also you will show your side of, you know, your, your, your professionalism, which they will, you know, react to. And so you'll then kind of uh, often need to really use your journalism skills to be able to think laterally, because sometimes the data you want isn't as detailed as you need it. So you need to dig deep and figure out ways to find ways to bring data in as a proxy. So for example, there's a story that I helped work on um, looking at FEMA disaster data, recovery funds. After a disaster occurs, who is more likely to get uh, you know, approved for, for uh, recovery funds? And so we wanted to see if, you know, were, we, we heard anecdotally that black residents were more likely to be declined because they didn't have the documentation proving that they owned the land, because in some instances they inherited the land from you know, former slaves. And so they didn't have the paperwork. And so that never really passed down generation to generation. So FEMA didn't have that level of detail in the data. So what we had to do was we had to mash it up with census data and figure out you know, where did these rejection rates occur in counties um, that were, were they black majority or were they white majority? And then figure out that percent that way. So we had to figure out a proxy because we couldn't say, you know, more black residents were, were rejected. We could say there were more rejections in black majority counties, double the rate of non-black majority counties. So that's all we could do. And that's all you can really do sometimes. And so you're gonna be working with data a lot that, um, that can't answer the questions you want it to answer. So you got to come up with ways and the best way to, to, to join it with other sets of data that can help you get close to that answer. It won't be the perfect answer, but it'll be close enough that you can then write and then speak to other experts and uh, other researchers who can then shore up your analysis. You know, So it's not just your thing thing, it's just like your thing saying it, and then other people also backing it up with their own personal expertise. This is also a story from Reveal recently where they kind of did the same thing, where they took well, they wanted to see where, who was getting PPP loans more often. Were, were, were white business owners getting it or were black business owners? You know, And so they couldn't get that data. So they had to mash it up with census data to figure out um, the disparities. So like in the LA area, businesses in white neighborhoods received loans at a far higher rate than in Latinx, black and Asian ones, right? So do you see where they're kind of like the, the fuzzy, fuzziness is happening? But that's all you can do sometimes. So they they geolocated every single business. They put it in different areas, and they said this area got this much money. This area got that much money. And then they figured it out. They grouped it by, you know, who was the majority, and they figured out that businesses in white neighborhoods receive loans more. There's some caveats to this particular analysis when it comes to PPP loans. I won't get into it now, but uh, it's a little bit messy, but I wanted to bring this up because I feel like it's relevant to a lot of the data that you're gonna be working with. Okay, so another tip is to share your data. Um, so this is a two week year old boy 
and he's among thousands of children separated from their parents and forced into state care by an opioid epidemic. He is pretty much in a closet, screaming his lungs out. And it's fractured families in every corner of West Virginia, claiming 5,200 lives over two decades. So from 2009 to 2017, as pain pills flooded West Virginia, counties with the highest rates of opioid overdose deaths also tend to see higher rates of child abuse and neglect cases. So we could always see the effects of the opioid epidemic, right? We could see where people died. We could see where they overdosed. And then we can kind of connect it to where there was child abuse and neglect cases happening. So state officials say that more than 80% of children in foster care have been affected by the drug epidemic. So we weren't able to figure out the cause. We could see the effects, right? But um, did you know that every pain pill purchased is tracked by the Drug Enforcement Agency Administration, which is under the Department of Justice? And it's called the Automation of Reports and Consolidated Orders System, or as I like to, as everyone likes to call it, ARCOS for short. So this is data we knew existed. We knew how many pills were out there because the, the DEA they released it at an aggregate level by zip code, I think, only totals. But we could never get a hold of the raw data. When we requested it, it was always denied. So that's when the Post and uh, HD Media, the owner of the Charleston Gazette Mail jumped in and they appealed the decision. This was a few years ago because what they were this the big there was a big lawsuit against these pharmaceutical companies and we didn't want to try to sue for it the data but we wanted to sue to make it public that the data that was already part of this lawsuit public um and so they ruled the uh, the uh, a group of appellate judges ruled that the protective order on arcos data should be amended finally and in effect they released the arcos data from 2006 to 2012 only because the DEA's argument was we're not releasing this data because we might be conducting investigations and it would affect that. So like, okay, well, through 2012, you can have it because hopefully any investigations through that time are done. So we got the data, huge data set, big. It was 42 columns and billions of rows. It contains literally hundreds of millions of rows of data for every pain pill sold between 2006 and eventually 2014 when they released the Fuller data set. And it showed where each pill moved from manufacturer to distributor to pharmacy. And for the first time, we could see everything both in aggregate and fine detail. So we could see that overall, 100 billion pills saturated the country between 2006 and 2014. And deaths from opioids soared in communities that were flooded with pain pills. So the highest per capita death rates nationwide were in rural West Virginia, Kentucky, and Virginia. So before we had the deaths, but we could never see where the pills were coming from or how, where they were saturated. And you can see there's totally an overlap now. We could never see that before. And we could see that just six companies distributed 76% of the pills during this period. And we could drill down into individual pharmacy chains like Walgreens and how they, you know, Walgreens themselves handled nearly one in five of the most addictive opioids. And it's an interesting thing because they had this really novel thing. So as I mentioned, we had manufacturer, distributor, pharmacy. Walgreens owned distributors and pharmacies. So talking about vertical integration, right? So they could not argue that they didn't know what pharmacies were getting how much pills because other pharmacies tried to argue that. Like, we don't, we don't know that the community was getting flooded. We just knew that we had a lot. Walgreens couldn't, couldn't argue that. So in 2009, you could, say, you could see that 30 million pills of oxycodone were shipped to Florida by drug companies in the United States. That was half of all oxy prescribed in the entire country that year. And so we were able to geocode every single pharmacy and figure out the kind of like the range of what was normal and what wasn't normal. And you could look up your local pharmacy to see were they in line or were they outsized in their opioid like ordering. 
and you could drill down in individual pharmacies. This was one in uh, Oviedo, Florida, and you can obviously see, see it failed to implement an effective system for monitoring their opioid sales for suspicious orders. So you can see there's the Florida average, like the little black line. And then this store exceeded it so much by month. Uh, and you can see there was like a drop in sales by the red bar graph, where a new law was signed in Florida saying you can't sell oxy, um, Oxycontin, you know? So you can see a drop, but then it picks back up again because people started realizing, well, if I order this other type of pill, then I can get the same thing, get the same effect. And so then sales skyrocket and they continued skyrocketing in this particular town. And you could see um, when we dove into it, we, we were looking like, well, is there anything else affecting, what is usually the effect of more sales and drugs? Probably crime. And so we saw that the, we looked up that the Oviedo police chief actually wrote to Walgreens executives and said that stores there had become a bastion of illegal drug sales and drug use. And he begged them, begged them to like, please stop selling to folks who have been previously arrested for, for you know, illegally selling oxycodone. And so then you see they ignored it and they kept going until then you see a drop. And the drop occurred because they got wind that the DEA was investigating them. And so finally, when DEA serves their warrant, they had you know, conveniently stopped by then. But we were able to see in the data because we had manufacturer, distributor, pharmacy, we could see that there were kind of two primary distributors that Walgreens owned in, far, in Florida. And this light pink one is from the one that was sent to that, was sending pills to that particular problematic pharmacy. But then as we looked at the data and we compiled it and we sliced it, we could see that, yeah, after the DEA served their warrant, they were like, oh, we're going to be better. We're going we're gonna to stop. We're going to cut back. And so they did. But then, you know, who else stepped up? The other farm, the other distributor, Walgreens distributor. So that's all you, we could see that in the data. And I think recently there was a story that came out showing that CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart were held liable for all those flooding these counties with pain bills. And so we made this data public, right? Because it was huge. And there's more stories that we can just tell it by, by ourselves. You know, um, so there were countless more. We made the data available. We let it, we sliced it and let, let folks download it by county. And we made an R package for it and Python package. So people could then create their own like really quick stories with it, their own analysis. And just in the first few weeks, we, you know, we were kind of tracking how many stories were the people were writing individually across the country. Uh, the Cleveland Plains dealer wrote about a small town doctor who was responsible for 1.6 million pills, the majority in that county. Um, another uh, news organization, the Daily Union in Wisconsin, looked at it from another angle. They said, you know, wh which of these lawmakers are getting the most money from these distributors or manufacturers? Andrew, this is all really fascinating. Um, the wide array of your work is really something. Um, I wonder, um, just because we we are getting kind of close to an hour and I wanna make sure that everyone has time to ask questions, um, if we might pivot to that. Um, I know that you had some more slides. Just a couple more and I'll wrap up, I promise. Okay. <laughs> uh, there were a couple of, uh, they noticed that some of the uh, pharmacies were responsible, were owned by actual lawmakers. Like here was one in Louisiana. There was one in Tennessee. And these lawmakers actually turned out were, were passing led trying to pass legislation, kind of either relaxing the limits of opioid distribution or restricting marijuana, uh, medicinal marijuana. And so, yeah, I mean, kind of like the one big takeaway from all this is like, as journalists, when it comes to data, the underlying philosophical question is, do you see the hat or do you see the elephant inside the boa? Like, do you see only what's in front of your face or do you have the ability and imagination to see what might be under the surface? Do you see the people represented by the statistics? Can you think laterally to try to answer questions by bringing in other data sets? And I feel that is my presentation. And so I added a few resources. Um, a lot of them are, are specific, but I feel like the other stuff you can get from this great workshop that you're going, uh, this great fellowship that you are a part of now. So thanks everyone.
let's dive into questions. Um, Ariyama, would you like to ask yours out loud? Sure. Um, you mentioned geocode a bunch of times, and I was wondering, is that like you just Google it and you drop the pin and you're writing it down, or is it something more technical? That is, that is um, usually how I do it, if it's just a handful. But there are okay. two services. Usually they are paid. Um, usually we use Google Maps API, but that costs money. If you are a nonprofit, you do have a discount. Um, you also have like a set amount before you get charged. So usually a lot of your requests can meet that, but a lot of easier geocoding options, which is um, for everyone else, it means taking an address, putting it into the computer and then getting back latitude and longitude. And once you get latitude and longitude, you can do a lot of cool stuff with that. You can map it, you can put it into census tracts, you can put it into county tracts and then do a lot of really interesting overall general analysis. Uh, so two services I would recommend is um, if you Google, so the census actually has a geocoder and you can do batches. I think you can do between 5,000 or 10,000 addresses at a time. Uh, it's not, it's it, it's only if they if it fits in their database though. So sometimes you're gonna get like a lot of errors. Um, another service you could use. So there's Google Maps API, there's census geocoder, and there's also geocode.io. Uh, that's another service that people like to use. Um, if anyone else has questions, feel free to um, raise your hand in the chat. Um, and also uh, we will be sharing Andrew's slides. Um, I would definitely recommend for anyone who's interested in learning R, checking out um, those links that he had um, in his resources list um, that he's taught that a lot um, from intro to um, <laughs> more sophisticated than I know what to do with, so. Andrew, I had a question. You were, when you were talking about the Roy Moore story, you mentioned uh, the data miner plugin. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Just sort of explain the how it works. Sure. So all of every website, there's like a little bit of a structure behind it, HTML, and so um, and tables. And so there's there's sometimes ways, if it's not too complicated, of of, of code like JavaScript isn't too involved, then you can scrape and pull data from tables or even from like Amazon listings, right, or Google reviews. Right. If it's there, you can like, and it, it's a way that it's a plugin that allows you to train. Like it, it, you have to tell it, okay, this is a row. Okay. This is a column. I want you to name this, this column. So it's, it's a, it's like what you would do normally if you were programming it to scrape it yourself, but it's more point and click based. So it's a lot easier. And there's a lot of video tutorials to help walk you through it. And if it's a pretty common site like Amazon, for example, or Kickstarter, then there's a lot of recipes that people have already created that you can just replay. You know, that, that's, they make it, it's really usable, usability, it's really good usability, a good design work. So um, one thing that people did with it recently that I just noticed was like, you remember those Amazon reviews um, for candles? I don't know if anyone else saw that. It's probably like a very data-centric thing for me, but uh, what people noticed was, unscented, no, I'm sorry, scented candles um, after, you know, the trends for the ratings were, you know, were usually fives, fours, whatever, but you could see a noticeable dip as COVID started kicking in because, you know, you can't smell, right? That's one of the symptoms of COVID. And so people who didn't know they had COVID were, realized, were saying like, I can't smell this candle anymore. Like this is a horrible candle. And so people were pulling, scraping those reviews, scraping those stars from the Amazon candle reviews, you know, and they could scrape back like, oh, I want 1000, I want 2000, whatever. And then they could then put it in one big spreadsheet, you know, isolate it by month and year, and then make a chart and feel like, see like, oh, you can see the dips. You know, usually when there's a surge of coronavirus, then there's like a dip in ratings for, uh, for scented candles. So there's, so that's, that's one example that I think of like, that's relevant to like scraping data. I'm gonna invite you all to unmute if you'd like and give Andrew a, a round of applause um, as our first speaker. Thank you, Andrew, so much for your time. Um, and uh, this was really helpful and fascinating. It was my pleasure. Good luck, y'all. <laughs>